Hey, everyone. Welcome to the 274th episode of the Internet of Things podcast. This is your host, Stacey Higginbotham, and your co-host, Kevin Toffel. And we have a lot to talk about this week. There was WWDC. We're going to cover what Apple has shared with all of us regarding HomeKit and IoT. Smart Things has some big changes coming to its platform that we're going to talk about. Wise launched its outdoor camera. We've got some industrial IoT news with Microsoft acquiring CyberX, and Deutsche Telekom is going to spin out its IoT unit. In smaller bits, we're going to be talking about Google stopping Hue support, a new talent for Misty Robotics, Tuya, Segway, and a sneak preview of a gadget that's coming out soon. Y'all are going to want to stay tuned for this. And our guest this week is Mark Benson, the head of engineering at Smart Things, who's going to cover what Smart Things is doing. All of this is sponsored by Very. Actually, you're going to hear twice from Very this show. So let's get started with our first spot. Are you looking for an IoT development team who's been there, done that? Very's award-winning full-service IoT development firm will work with you to deliver your IoT solution on time and on budget. Learn more at www.verypossible.com. That's www.verypossible.com. Okay, Kevin. I'm back. You're back. Thank you. We're glad to have you. Yay. Yay. And we put you right to work. You get back on Monday and we're like, Kevin, go sit in front of your either Apple TV or your Safari browser for a while to check out the virtual WWDC. What do you think? Actually, you can watch it on anything now. They've opened up and that's kind of the theme that we're going to talk about a little bit with WWDC and how it relates to this show. I would have watched it anyway, by the way. So it really I wasn't, know. it wasn't work for me. Yeah. So we won't talk about all the non IOT stuff. There was a bunch of that and new arm chips and max. But what I say is the real stars of WWDC were IOT sensors, machine learning, and the chips, the chips that Apple's been putting in products, but not taking fully advantage of for quite some time. And that's going to change. So Man, this is Apple's long game here, because some of these chips they have developed, they've bought, well, they've, they've developed their own silicon, they bought several companies almost a decade ago now. So this is this is long. They play the long game. They definitely play the long game. And from a consumer standpoint, like if you're a HomeKit user, I I'm like, I don't want the long game. I want it all and I want it now. But that hasn't happened. However, there is a ton of IoT related bits in the, the products and software that Apple has shown off at WWDC. For example, and I think you have something similar with your Tesla, like you can unlock the car with your phone. Yes, I can. I do have to open the app and unlock it. I can also honk the horn remotely, which is very fun when someone else is driving. <laughs> well, you can't do that with iOS, but you can unlock the car and start the car with your phone. And it's not just using an app. In fact, it's not using an app at all. It's using something called Car Key, which Apple has debuted with iOS 14, but is bringing it to iOS 13 as well. So you don't have to wait potentially for new iPhones or the new software to get this. They use the NFC chip in the iPhone and you tap the iPhone to the door handle of your vehicle and it unlocks. And then if you have a supportive vehicle with a wireless charging pad, you put your phone on the charging pad and you can just press the start button of your car to start it up. Now, where I get really excited about this is using the ultra wideband chip for fine grain location, because when I walk up to my Tesla, it actually, when I get within a certain range, it will automatically unlock. The, the door handles pull out. It's actually one of the nicest features. Right. So and it sounds like that's coming one day, one day. Soon. Well, here's why it's not going to come out immediately. According to Apple, they are talking about creating a industry standard for the auto industry for next year's cars that use that UWB or ultra wideband chip that's already in iPhones. And that means you won't have to use the NFC chip. You can just leave your phone in your pocket, your bag, whatever. As you walk up, it can unlock, for example. 
So is this going to be an Apple industry standard, which means that Apple will force people to use it on iPhones? And if I don't have an iPhone, it doesn't matter. Well, you got to believe that Google will come up with something similar. Oh, great. Don't, don't forget. So then we'll have we, we the, the CarPlay. Car <laughs> CarPlay versus Android, Android Auto. Android Auto. Yes. Hey. Okay. Yes. Well, Round what four. What else? For those who use AirPods Pro, not the old AirPods, which I have, Apple's adding something they call spatial audio. It supports 5.1, 7.1, and Dolby Atmos sound. And basically, it creates a surround sound field of audio with the AirPods Pro. That in itself is, wasn't too amazing to me. What was is that they're using the accelerometer and the gyroscope in the AirPod Pro and in the iOS device you're watching or listening on. And what happens is it's calculating when your head moves versus when the screen moves to keep that field stable. So that way it's always, it always sounds correct no matter how you're facing, right? You know what this is? What this is, is devices sharing context between each other. Boom. And this is big. This is what we've been wanting forever. Apple's apparently doing it within its own ecosystem. Like it always does. This is the benefit of controlling your own ecosystem. <laughs> it's much easier to do this. I won't lie. I use Chromebooks all day long or Linux, but I use iPhones and an iPad for that reason. Yeah, I use a MacBook. But I use Android. We're goofed up, but We're, whatever. We are strange people. Okay, what else? Well, I also use an Apple Watch, and of course, that's getting a little bit too, thanks to the sensors inside and some machine learning models, which will be used to capture sleep data. And Apple says they're sensing micro motions and the rise and fall of your breathing to calculate that sleep data and your trends. So... It's always been third-party apps to use to capture sleep data on an a Apple Watch. You won't have to do oh, that Oh, I didn't anymore. realize that. Yes, it is. Okay. No, and part of that is because of the battery life, because the first one's barely got through a day, and now you might be able to eke out two days. So most people charge it at night. Got it. Okay, that makes yeah. sense. Yep, yep. So. Fitbit is actually my favorite thing about my Fitbit. Interesting. It, it correlates very, like the scores they give me correlate very strongly to actually how I feel. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, oh, very smart. Yes. Also, for anybody participating in the COVID-19 studies, <laughs> a lot of the data in indicators that people are working from seem to be discovered is not the word, but the sleep data is what tends to predict your COVID status. It's your breathing rates during sleep. Sometimes it's your resting heart rate being elevated. So for what that's worth. Even just from an exercise standpoint, my Garmin would calculate using sleep to if I was refreshed enough to take on a, a tougher workout today or not. It would recommend I don't, for example, if I got three hours of sleep. I really love the fact that, no, Kevin, stop. Don't do it. Don't work out. Don't do it. <laughs> just ride a segue down the hill. Oh, we'll get to that later. We'll get there. Too soon on that segue. Too wow, soon. Wow. But you mentioned COVID, so I have to mention this. The Apple Watch has a handy new feature or will have a handy new feature with the new operating system. It's going to detect when you're washing your hands based on the movement of your hands. And it's going to be listening to the sounds of running water or a soap dispenser to determine if you're washing hands. If you are, it pops up a cutesy little 20 second timer with bubbles that counts down. So that way you wash properly. Oh, that's both cool and creepy. Like I tell people, once you have these sorts of devices, they can build an algorithm that can tell all kinds of things, whether you're yeah. washing your hands enough or if you're picking your nose. So just be uh, aware. Well, like the nose picking option, I suspect the hand washing is optional. You can probably yes. turn it off. So good. Yeah. So HomeKit, HomeKit, HomeKit. I actually was impressed. I mean, it's not everything I want and more, but there were some nice little features that are being added and some hints of some future features as well that I'll get to in a minute. First is HomeKit lights are getting something called adaptive lighting. So what this will do is throughout the day, it will automatically adjust the color temperature of your HomeKit lights for you. So you'll have warmer lights in the morning and the evening and blue light during the day, cooler lights during the day. I think this is great because I have to manually set all this crap up. This is awesome. There was a company that was trying to do this 
I don't think they're around anymore. It was noon and they actually had lighting designers come in and set this up for people. Hugh also actually has a time of day lighting. I think it's a beta feature or a lab feature. You can turn it on and see how it works for you. But yeah, this is exactly what we wanted our smart devices to do for us, not just for us to manually control it, but for voila. And just to be smarter. So we don't have to be as smart. <laughs> more, more home kits, lighting features. And I love this. I love this. I love this. Now, once you add new home kit lights or other supported devices to your home kit home, it, once they're paired, you'll immediately get a pop up on your phone that suggests common automation, such as light automations it might be when I arrive, turn on, or when I leave, turn off. Or if you detect motion, turn on. Same with garage doors and other things. So they're, they're making the usability much better because they're surfacing suggestions right up front. Nice. And that's going to be a trend going forward. We're finally getting to the place where, and you'll see this actually in some of the other stuff we're going to talk about on this show, we're seeing the intelligence actually start to come to these devices. So it is about time. Yes. And then one last thing in HomeKit, I did not realize that with HomeKit cameras, apparently they don't have facial recognition and activity zones just to monitor certain areas, but apparently they don't. So that's coming. And now the HomePod will actually be able to announce who's at your front door, for example, if it recognizes a familiar face. That's something we've had on other platforms for a while. So I was a little surprised to see that. Privacy thing? Probably. And that makes sense. Apple will certainly defer to privacy over a feature in most cases. Additionally, all these camera notifications can automatically appear on your TV if you have an Apple TV. So again, that tight integration. And I didn't realize that was also something that they didn't have as well, but that's coming too. Yay. And then there's just a couple other like Little things that much of that came out in the actual keynotes during WWDC, but developers were still meeting and doing things and they, are they still? I, believe, I don't even know what day it is anymore. Yeah, I, be, I believe it's still going on. It's now all just developer sessions and such. Yes. So we'll still see some more stuff trickle out, but iOS 14 has added recognition for alarms and sirens. They're joining Google and Amazon kind of devices and digital assistants and, and recognizing these sorts of alarms if you want them to. That's been seen on a beta of iOS 14 on an iPhone, but I suspect it would be more useful on, say, a HomePod. Agree. And then let's talk about the Apple opening up the Find My network, because we have actually been waiting for Apple tags and the idea of Apple being able to do some sort of location tracking of all of your devices for a while. Yes. So this is new because if you have an iOS device, there's the Find My app for people who are not familiar with it. You can find, say, your family if they use iPhones and, to, and enable this uh, feature to be on on their phones, for example. So you can track your family, which is nice, or see where they are. I shouldn't say track. But additionally, if you have Mac devices or iPads you can, and you lose them, you can use the Find My network to find them. But that's only been an Apple device thing and an Apple app thing. Now... Apple is opening up to developers the Find My Network access. So that is cool in one regard. Tell me, first of all, what that means. What does that enable me to do? So if I make a product, maybe it's a non-Apple laptop or tablet, I can create an app that taps into the Find My Network with Apple. And therefore, if my if I lose that device, the non-Apple device, I can still go find it on the using a Find My app. Got it. Okay. Now, tell me what you think. Well, I think it's, again, good for consumers, but for companies that make other types of tracking devices and services, they got, what's the term, Sherlocked, I guess? Yeah, when Apple basically creates something that a third party has already had out there. and Oh, I just think of that as being Amazon, but okay. I think it actually, well, not, wouldn't be Osborne either, but anyway. But the point <laughs> is that if you're Tile, this yes. may be a problem. That is correct. That is correct. If you're even at Samsung, maybe Samsung makes tracking tags that work with its hub. They could expand their audience and work with the Find My Network for Apple people. But it could also be a good thing for people who have a tile because it throws more things. It, it broadens the overall network, right? 
It doesn't just broaden it. I mean, it literally pinpoints. The Find My Network is outstanding. It's not so, crowdsourced. It's an Apple run service. Yeah. So then maybe, maybe we could find things, especially, I mean, there are iPhones everywhere, right? So <laughs> we could find things faster in areas where maybe there's not people with a lot of tiles. Could be. We'll have to see what they do with it. Okay. Well, I may be excited, but I'm also, there's a little trepidation there. I would love for this to be really open. Speaking of open, there's one more bit that I know you're interested in, and that's Apple opening up that U1 chip to developers. They have a new nearby interaction framework that they can use to create apps using Apple's ultra wideband chip. And I am super excited about this chip because like we always say, context is really important. And this chip gives fine grained location. And by fine grained, we're talking inches and centimeters, which means your phone might know if you are standing in front of your refrigerator as opposed to your stove. Kind of depends on how large your kitchen is. And even which way you're facing in the kitchen. Exactly. So this is actually really compelling from a context point of view. So we'll, we'll keep an eye on this. But we must move on. We have spent a long time on Apple. Yeah, I mean, it's worth it. A lot of good stuff. But now, another big smart home platform, SmartThings, now owned by Samsung, is making some changes. And I think these changes are going to upset the most hardcore users, but we're going to explain why. And we actually have Mark Benson coming on the show later, who's going to explain in great detail what's happening and why. So I'm just going to do a quick summary and get Kevin's take. This is part of smart things is changing its hardware strategy and its backend platform. And the reason it's doing this is because it really wants to focus on surfacing intuitive experiences and services, just like Apple did with things like adaptive lighting, right? The idea is we're beyond the smart home where I as a user have to buy a device, connect it, and program my automations and do everything myself, right? Smart things, Apple, Google, Amazon, everybody in the space wants to get us to the point where we buy a device, we attach it to our network, and then their respective services say, hey, you have this, this, and this, and you seem to fall in this kind of category. Would you like to do this? And you'll be like, oh my God, that'd be great. Make it so, and it will happen. That's the end game here for everybody. And this is why SmartThings is doing what it's doing. So what is it doing? Two things. On the hardware side, it is going to still make hubs. That's still happening. And it's still going to have its own brand of hardware that will be manufactured by other companies. But it's also opening up and doing more deals with companies to put its software on their hubs and to have a works with SmartThings devices out there in the world. So that's not entirely new. You will see probably some of your older SmartThings gear, like when you bought your original SmartThings hub, it, it came with some sensors. Those are probably going to start dying soon. SmartThings says it's going to tell us when that's going to happen. The back end stuff is where things get pretty complicated and where I think people are going to get a little upset. One, if you are not on the SmartThings modern app, which came out in like 2018, you're going to be forced to move later on this year. So SmartThings Classic is going to go completely away. Along with that are some features that you're probably going to be sad about, or some people are going to be sad about. SmartThings is not telling me what those features are. So we don't know <laughs> what they are yet, but they are going to warn you. And they said they won't deprecate features if there's nothing to replace it. We'll have to cross our fingers, hope that happens. Two, they're getting rid of Groovy and replacing it with an API. And three, they're getting rid of their IDE and replacing that with, quote, robust developer tools. Okay, that's it. Kevin, your take. Go. Okay, so it's the last two bits that you mentioned that are going to upset, I think, a very small but super passionate part of the Samsung SmartThings community. Groovy is the language used to create what's called device handlers. Device handlers make the device work with the hub. If Samsung supports a device natively, they create the handler. So that's fine. But there have been a lot of new products on the market that don't work with the smart things ecosystem. But by using Groovy, if you're a developer or a hacker and you know what you're doing, you can create a device handler. I had to do that some tweaking of some with some Fabaro sensors, for example, to make them work because they're just not natively supported. If that goes away, 
just like all the other platforms now, you as a SmartThings user are totally dependent on Samsung's Works with SmartThings program. Meaning, if a device maker doesn't use the Works with SmartThings, it's not going to work with SmartThings, and you are not going to be able to make it work with SmartThings. And today, you can make it work with SmartThings if you know what you're doing. So that's number one. Number two ties into number one because the developer IDE is where you would do the groovy coding. That's going away. Okay, that's fine. If Samsung doesn't have an API, here's the bottom line. If Samsung doesn't have an API that a device maker can use, that device isn't going to work, and there's nothing you can do about it. That's the difference. Exactly. Now, we'll hear from Mark. And he'll explain why they're doing this, and you can decide for yourself if this is worthwhile. I am impressed so far that SmartThings recognizes that the people who support these one-off weird devices, it is a huge competitive differentiator for them. I don't yes. think they're going to alienate them too much. I think they're going to strive to work with the developer community. They're doing this the same reason Google changed their works with Nest program which is to get more control over their platform. And frankly, I can't fault them for that because all the other platforms have their own little programs that the siloed ecosystems is what we're coming up with. That's that's just the way it is right now. Yeah. But Chip's going to save everything. Don't worry. Samsung is one of the partners for Chip. And As is Amazon and Apple, which Apple even mentioned on stage, and is Google. So yes, there is hope. There is hope. And hopefully by the end of the summer, sometime in September, we're going to hear more about Chip. We'll see. Am I holding my breath? No, because that would be no. crazy. But I'll be hopeful. Okay. So keep listening because Smart Things Mark Benson is coming on as our guest to talk in detail about these changes. All right. We're moving on to Wise. Hey, everybody who wants the Wise Outdoor Cam, now is your moment for $49.99. The Wise Cam Outdoor is available. It is IP65 weather rated. Yay! It is battery powered. Yay! And it has 1080p recording and motion detection. So this is good. It also has two way audio for when you want to shout at that deer who's eating your lawn or talk to your burglar friend. I don't know. Scare your family on the front porch like I do. Mm -hmm. Because this is battery powered, what's going to happen is you're going to get 12 second motion activated videos. It's going to be saved automatically to the cloud for 14 days. You don't need a subscription. So everybody who is like, I need an outdoor camera, but man, Nest is just brutally expensive. This is probably where you're going to want to go. And this is pretty compelling. Even my Arlo's are they're more expensive than this. Now, yeah, this is this is like one third or a quarter of the price of most outdoor cameras. Yeah. This does require a separate base station. So your intro package with the camera is going to ship with a base station. So you'll get one, and then each base station will support four cameras. Each additional camera is $39.99. Yes. So that's the news. It's very exciting. I expect these to go quickly. All right. Next up. Some enterprise -y news. Microsoft is acquiring Israeli security company CyberX. And I wrote about this this week. And this is basically a deal. CyberX is an OT security firm. This is operations technology or operational technology. This is machines talking to machines, not computers talking to computers. I know a computer's a machine. Just let's not get there. But what it's doing is all of Microsoft has been really focused on industrial IoT and they've done really well there. But as they go deeper and deeper into these networks, they're coming up against a problem, which is if you have a manufacturing plant or an existing building infrastructure, you don't want to actually pull out all of those sensors and that gear and replace it with current secure stuff. And by current secure, I'm thinking Microsoft's Azure Sphere. One, Azure Sphere has to be installed in new devices only. And two, it requires a lot more memory. So there's going to be this whole category of devices out there that are not secured by things like Azure Sphere, which is the gold standard right now for IoT security. Not necessarily Sphere, but the idea that your device has a secure enclave that connects securely to the cloud and can check for updates, viruses, vulnerabilities, and do identification. 
That's the gold standard. Azure Sphere happens to do that. So all these old devices, what are they going to do? The answer for Microsoft is they're going to rely on CyberX. And CyberX is well known in the industry. Its customers are huge, Fortune 500 companies, telcos, utilities. There's a lot. And what CyberX does is it doesn't need to be installed on each individual device. Instead, you install it on the network and it will look at behavior of those devices. So it will be like, oh, is this device trying to ping a weird server? Yes. Is this device acting strangely? Yes. Let's quarantine it. Let's notify someone. So CyberX can run and and Microsoft's going to buy it. They're going to basically run it as part of their Azure IoT security suite of services. So other companies can buy it and you can still run CyberX on-premise if you want on an air-gapped network, which is still going to be very important to a lot of customers, or you can now run it as a service from Microsoft. So yay, big deal. Signals, I expect we're going to see a lot of the big IT companies start buying these sorts of firms. We saw Cisco, for example, partner up with Nozomi Networks, which has a similar OT focus. So yay. Other industrial enterprising news, Deutsche Telekom is spinning out its IoT unit and it's creating an open IoT hub business. This is a big deal. The new business is called Deutsche Telekom IoT. This hub is pretty vague. It's basically some sort of platform. It's quote unquote, the new industry meeting place for the IoT to which I'm like, who cares? (laughs) (laughs) Those words mean nothing. There are lots of platforms out there. And it remains to be seen what DTs is going to look like. But the reason they're doing this is worth noting. And that is because the telcos are getting in their own way here because it's one thing to sell connectivity, but you can't alienate all your partners by trying to sell connectivity and services on top of it like they were trying to do. Because then systems integrators don't necessarily want to get involved. Other partners are like, why would I work with you when I have, for example, my own cloud or my own data analytics solution? So we'll come back. We'll try to get maybe DT to come on and talk about what they're going to do on a show later, but it's worth looking at. And I think it's the right move. Okay. Oh, news bits. Quick ones. Google stopping support for the Philips Hue Bridge version one. Philips Hue has stopped support for this. So it doesn't surprise me that Google's stopping support for this, but it will probably break a couple things for people. Well, yeah, you won't be able to control by voice. I mean, I would imagine the hub will still work, but you can't control it by voice with Google anyway. After Well, and I think the hub only works locally still. So it no longer Eesh. actually connects to the internet. So this is not surprising. Time to upgrade. And just as a reminder, Hue is only going to support its devices for three years after you buy them, especially the hubs. Its lights, it's mm-hmm. still supporting, which is good because these lights should last forever because they're LEDs. Well, not forever, but like 20 years. You can't sell 20-year bulbs and say we only support them for three. <laughs> and that's why they did the hub strategy, which makes sense. It's what we've asked for. But I'm like, hmm, do I want to buy a $60 hub every three years for smart lights? This is a no. question. So, Misty, tell me about Misty. Misty, Misty Robotics. Um, this is a very interesting robot that I've been following over the years. It's too expensive to buy, unfortunately, so I don't have one. But Misty has a new feature, and it's COVID-related. The little robot can basically do automated touchless temperature screening for businesses. So maybe you place Misty on a kiosk where people check in to come in to your building, and the robot can greet the person, take their temperature, and basically determine if they should be allowed in the building, if they have a fever or not. So I think that's pretty smart. I mean, there's that's the one thing about all these robots is finding uses for them. And yeah, there's lots of sensors and, and compute and connectivity, but okay, what do you do with it after you spend thousands of dollars? I think this is brilliant. Or at least useful. Okay. Tuya, the IoT platform from China, has joined the Zigbee Alliance Board of Directors. This is notable two reasons. Zigbee Alliance is where we have the Connected Home over IP project or CHIP. And Tuya is joining as a key promoter of that project, which makes sense. It'll be good. Tuya is the back end for a lot of companies like 
Walmart, actually. A lot of Walmart brand, the Mercury brand of devices is built on Tuya. And so are lots of other connected devices that you probably may not have heard of. But this does bring up this idea of Tuya is joining the Zigbee Alliance. CHIP is probably going to become one of the more important programs under the Zigbee Alliance. And I am waiting to see if Zigbee is going to like split this out or what happens. Are we going to stop having it be called the Zigbee Alliance? There's a lot of questions. The success of CHIP kind of threatens the success of the idea of a Zigbee Alliance, right? You're going to want another, a more generic name, perhaps. So just throwing that out there. And we have a sad story A sad story from Kevin? I'm sad. I'm sad. A story that makes Kevin sad. Right. So 20 years ago, something debuted with some sensors in it that I think is a really cool device. It never really took off. And now it's going away. I'm talking about the original Segway human transporter. Segway shutting down production for the last model, the Segway PT. And some people are getting laid off, which is not good. Segway does make still a bunch of other self-balancing scooters and such. What will amusement park cops ride now? Well, don't say that because my family bought me a Epcot tour on a Segway and I had such a blast. How am I going to tour Epcot now? Walk? Your hoverboard. I have one of those, but I like the handles and it was much much more control when you have the handles, in my opinion, than just a standard alone hoverboard, but... All right. Well, don't be sad because we have a new device coming that may help you get over your Segway sadness. Maybe. And this is a teaser, I guess we'll say for next week, because I think by next week I can talk about this more and I'll tell you what it is right now. It is the Amazon Echo Frames, which we have as part of the early preview, which it's a $175 price if you get invited in. Wait, tell people what the frames are because they launched this in September and they may have already forgotten. <laughs> oh, they are glasses frames and not like Google Glass because there's no camera here. These actually look like the glasses that I wear now. The only difference is that the arms are slightly thicker because there are two speakers on each side, both next to the ears. There is a microphone, a volume button, a power button, and some little LEDs just above where your eyeglass lens goes on the inside of the frame. And that only is to provide you like flashing notifications. So it's got Madame A built in. And for what's going to be $250, I am really curious if it's going to be worth it. And I'm not sure yet because I haven't had these long, but there's not a lot of extra features in here, I guess. I should warn everybody that Kevin did not buy the original Echo because he didn't see value in it. So I did not until they added the smart home stuff. Right. So this is the early stage of possibly the next platform play, but we'll talk about it more next week. But now it is time for the Internet of Things podcast hotline. The IoT Podcast Hotline is brought to you by Schlage. The best home automation adds convenience, not hassle. With its built-in Wi-Fi, the Schlage Encode Smart Wi-Fi Deadbolt shows just how easy secure can be. Learn more at schlage.com. And if you would like to be entered to win a Schlage lock this month, give us a call at 512-623-7422. Two four, and you will be entered to win. Now, let us go to this week's voicemail, which comes from Scott and actually relates to some things we learned about this week. This is Scott from Louisville, Kentucky, and I'm wondering if the Ring doorbell video can be seen on Apple TVs. I know it can be seen on Amazon products and on your iOS tablet or phone, but I can't tell if it's viewable on Apple TV products. Thank you for your time and great show. Okay. Kevin, I'm going to let you tackle this one. (laughs) So officially, natively, Ring is not supported on HomeKit or, or the Apple TV. So that's obviously why Scott's asking this question. If Scott or anybody else who's interested in this wants to use Homebridge, which is a kind of DIY software solution to basically run your own HomeKit server, you can get Ring Video on an Apple TV 
according to a GitHub repository that I found for Homebridge. That's a very DIY thing, though. You're going to need a, something, some hardware to run Homebridge on. You're going to have to install a certain software. And I don't know if that's really worth it to you. And I say that because something Apple did show at WWDC is video from security cameras on the Apple TV, as we previously mentioned in this podcast. So I don't think Apple's going to open it up. I don't think Ring's going to join in Amazon being an Amazon product. But the Homebridge solution right now, it works for most people. It may not be 100%. I suspect once Apple adds its own functionality to bring the camera feeds to Apple TV, then the Homebridge solution will dramatically increase. And Ring, for what it's worth, has promised HomeKit compatibility for several years now. And every year at CES, we're all like, maybe Ring will do it. Nope. That was pre-Amazon. It was pre-Amazon. Now, after the Amazon acquisition, though, they still reiterated their hopes for HomeKit compatibility. So Hmm. maybe we're going to just wait for Chip. Who knows? Maybe. Chip will save us. That's going to be our new show title. Chip will save us. All right. (laughs) It probably won't. All right, that concludes the voicemail. Remember, if you would like to be entered to win that Schlage lock, give us a call at 512-623-7424. And now that concludes this part of the show. Stay tuned for our guest, Mark Benson, the head of engineering for SmartThings, who is going to talk more about why they're changing the platform and what they're doing. And now, a message from our sponsor. Hey, everyone, we are taking a quick break from the Internet of Things podcast for a message from our sponsor. This week's sponsor is Very. Very is a fully distributed IoT engineering firm partnering with clients to build systems for smart manufacturing, smart energy and utilities, consumer electronics, and connected wellness. And today I have Ben Wald, who is the founder and head of client strategy at Very, here to talk to me. So Ben very often works with industrial clients on IoT projects. Can you tell us about how you are helping them? Absolutely. So manufacturers who have the ability to do remote monitoring and predictive maintenance on their machines have a competitive advantage. Study after study shows that these capabilities help companies shift away from time-based and scheduled maintenance more efficiently utilize their consumables and their workforce in general, increase productivity, maximize machine and part life, improve workplace safety, and ultimately reduce unplanned downtime. Excellent. So what does Vary actually do or build with clients? (laughs) That is a great question. So we, we build custom solutions. In many cases, we're working with companies who actually build the equipment and help them add more value to their machines maybe create visibility that they didn't have before, and sometimes even open up new revenue streams. So getting tactical, we help these equipment manufacturers build devices to retrofit existing equipment with new capabilities, send data to the cloud, and use the right machine learning models to find patterns, highlight anomalies, and capture insights from the operators on the ground. That's typically the critical step here is pairing software with human intelligence And it's really where a lot of quote-unquote universal solutions fail. The next step is the last mile element where we are taking these insights and integrating with existing systems that are handling the maintenance scheduling and some of the consumable ordering. As a quick example, we recently built and launched a device that both retrofits to older models and comes embedded with newer machines in the corrugation industry. It collects and sends over 2,000 data points from the machine to the cloud, and our machine learning model looks for anomalies outside of some predefined thresholds. We then allow and have created an interface for operators to label those events which means the system gets smarter each day. The last mile is that we've then integrated this platform into their maintenance scheduling system, their consumable ordering platform, and their CRM so that if they get a support request, the company can have insights into what may have led to that component failing and on the maintenance side, only perform maintenance when it's necessary. That sounds really comprehensive. So where do I go to learn more about how Vary can help me with my industrial IoT project? You can reach out to us at Very Possible dot com slash Stacy. That's V E R Y possible dot com slash S T A C E Y. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Internet of Things podcast. This is your host, Stacy Higginbotham, and today's guest is Mark Benson, who is the head of engineering at SmartThings. Hi Mark, how are you today? 
Hi, Stacey. I'm doing, doing very well. Thank you for having me. Oh, man, it is always a pleasure to talk to people from Smart Things. This is one of the first companies that I ever covered, like original IoT podcast all the way back in like, gosh, 2013, I think. But you're here on the show because things at Smart Things are changing. So let's help people understand where you're at today and what you're trying to do. Thank you, Stacy. And you are incred- an incredibly important voice in the IoT space and known for separating the signal from the noise. And uh, you're smart and cover topics that people want to talk about. So really, thank you for having me on. As a way of introducing just where Smart Things is at today, Smart Things, as most people know, is the easy way to turn your home into a smart home. It helps your living room go to sleep when you do. It keeps your home safe when you're away. And it helps reduce energy usage by doing things like turning off lights when you don't need them. All of our technology investment, our partnerships, our user experiences, they're all meant to help users live a more smart and connected life. And in the end, it's not about the technology at all, but it's rather about how that technology solves valuable problems. And it gives insight to users as the technology ideally fades into the fabric of their lives. The Internet of Things. Stacy, as you know, is not just a technology wave. It's really a macro economic movement. It represents new ways that people are interacting with their environments, their devices, data, and each other. And in the end, people just don't want technology for the sake of technology. They want their lives to be better. We, we talked before this, but in the smart home, you're looking for a more experience focus as opposed to kind of what I have now, which is a lot of fun, but it's where I stick a lot of sensors places and I'm like, ooh, let's see if I can create an automation. And then I kind of give up and I'm like, well, it's pretty cool that when I open this door, this light goes on. But now we're taking it a step further, hopefully and finally, correct? Yeah, that's exactly right. 2020 is a turning point year for a number of reasons. And that one that you mentioned, Stacy, is one of them. Connecting devices to the internet today is table stakes. Being able to remotely monitor and control devices and environments is something that consumers have really come to expect as basic building blocks of their smart home. But users are now looking beyond those simple monitoring and control applications towards things that matter to them, things that make their lives better. For example, reducing energy usage, better safety and security, and even lifestyle applications such as cooking, caring for elders, family members, and pets. And that is really a major movement that's happening right now is moving, use cases are moving beyond monitoring control to more services and experiences. And that's that's one of those main reasons why 2020 is a turning point year. But there's a couple other reasons. Another reason is that the home automation market in general is primed for growth. The price of sensors has dropped considerably in recent years, and a significant percentage of households are now exposed to smart home technology. And we couldn't say that just a few years ago. And finally, the third thing I'll mention is that industry standardization efforts are gaining momentum. Oh, do you mean something like CHIP? Exactly. CHIP is gaining significant momentum this year. CHIP is targeted at solving one of the top problems holding IoT back from mass adoption, which is complexity. It's the complexity of setup. It's the complexity of the use of devices. And it's the complexity of the lack of interoperability between those devices and other platforms and other brands. And so these things are really shaping up to make 2020 a turning point year. Okay. So you're about to talk about some serious changes that are going to happen with the platform and how developers and users experience it. So before we go to that, I really want to dig in on some of these use cases and experiences you're talking about, just to get people excited as opposed to going, ah, change is bad, scary. You mentioned things like security, energy efficiency. I feel like we have a lot of that today. So I know that I have sensors in my house. I have monitoring apps already. What is going to change? What is going to be better in the the post-2020 world? Yeah, great, great question. So for some of those use cases like reducing energy usage, there are, as you pointed out, there there are examples of that today. In fact, you can use smart things for those examples today. But what we are reaching in the industry is a point where the adoption rate is increasing significantly. People are looking for not only 
Is it possible to monitor and reduce energy usage, but is it easy? Does it give me recommendations on things that I could do? It's easy for someone who is a technologist and is you know, understands how all the technologies within their smart home works and to be able to set that up to reduce energy usage. But it's yet another thing for recommendations to, to come in a form that is very easy for mainstream users to just adopt some of those easy. So that's, that's one of those. And some of the other ones that I mentioned with lifestyle applications, such as caring for elders, family members, tracking where things are, pets, these things are emerging. And I think looking into the future, there will be a lot of very interesting use cases. These are only just a few examples of some of the many that I think are coming. But I I really believe that as we look back on this moment in 2020, in three years, that we will really look at this as a turning point where in the past it was really about some of those more simple use cases or, or advanced users being capable of setting up some advanced use cases and a, a transition to more where mainstream users are able to really uh, reap the value and the benefits from these in, a, in an easy and simple way. Got it. All right. So let's talk about what you're doing. You have, you've talked about it being in two components, a platform strategy component and a hardware strategy component. And I think we should probably talk about the hardware because we are a concrete people here at the IoT podcast and we love our hardware. So what is the plan there? For a hardware strategy, as a, as a home automation pioneer, smart things devices are already a central part of tens of millions of smart homes. Integrating devices on low power wireless networks and offering the ability to control those devices. Our strategy is to further build out the technology in those hardware devices so that hardware is is everywhere. It's more ubiquitous and works better together. SmartThings has has a hub. We've had a hub since uh, since the beginning of SmartThings. Smart home hubs enable connectivity and control with a large number of low power wireless device types and networks. Hubs enable consumers to have a more comprehensive and holistic control of their smart home and support advanced capabilities such as offline use cases, local automations, and advanced diagnostics. Hubs aren't going anywhere. But when the company began, SmartThings created hardware out of necessity in order to stimulate user growth and adoption. And that strategy, frankly, has been very successful. Today, a large portion of households have been exposed to home automation technology, and there's now a wide variety of partners that create sensors and devices that can be used in a range of situations that didn't exist just a few years ago. And so now we are looking to build on our success and partner with companies that are leaders in smart home automation that we can enlist to manufacture and distribute SmartThings hardware to allow us to further focus on highly differentiated experiences and growing our works with SmartThings and works as a SmartThings hub programs. And so although older device generations may be retired over time, current devices will continue to work And the technology that's found in SmartThings hubs, cameras, and sensors may be manufactured and or distributed by partners. Okay. So this means probably my seven-year-old SmartThings plug will stop working after some point in time? There is, you know, over time, there is always a point when legacy devices and products will get retired. We've had a long history of maintaining devices in the market for a long period of time. But as there is new technology products that come out, some older generations of products will be retired. Got it. But you're still going to sell the hubs. And what I'm going to see is you partnering with other companies. So maybe it's the Z-Wave sensor companies, and they're going to make SmartThings compatible products, or are they going to make the SmartThings products for you? It will be both. Partly partners that manufacture and distribute SmartThings products, including hubs and um, and sensors, and also partners that will create devices and sensors that work with smart things. So it will be, you will see both. So that won't be a huge change. I'll just expect to see some of my older stuff stop working over time. And I'm sure you'll tell me about it beforehand. Yes, absolutely. And we, if and when those times come, we will tell you beforehand and give uh, all of our users ample notice combined with a communications plan and support plan to make sure that the transition is as seamless as as possible. Okay. And people will always complain, but that doesn't, that makes sense. 
So that's the hardware changes. Let's talk about the platform because there's quite a bit happening there. And it sounds like a lot of this will change for people who are still on the SmartThings Classic app, which I believe y'all started phasing out sometime in 2018 to focus on the SmartThings Modern app, correct? Yeah, that's yeah, that's right. So we've been, uh, this is a shift that's been underway for, for some time. And so we've made some previous announcements um, about this. And so the, the smart things, the modern app that's called the smart things app um, in the app stores is the one that is the new app. And then the smart things classic app will be retired. And we're in a phased series of transitions for customers on that classic app to be able to make sure that they have a seamless migration and uh, experience to using the new app. But yes, all new customers and all of our active development and investment is in the, the new smart things app. Okay. So there's the talk of retiring your legacy app. That is that is one of the phases that's happening in your platform strategy. That is, I think, the first phase. So if I'm on ST Classic, I should expect that to go away? Yes. If you're on ST Classic, uh, that, will, uh, that will eventually go away. The plan is for that to happen around the end of Q3 or beginning of Q4 of this year. Okay. And if I'm on the modern app, it stays the same. But now things are happening on the back end. So what is happening on the back end? Yes. So uh, the proactive strategy shifts that we're making also apply to the back end. And so let me give you a summary of some of those changes uh, that are coming. And then we'll have more, more announcements and communication on this in the coming weeks and months. But starting in the second half of 2020, SmartThings will be announcing a phased series of transitions for customers to new services and integrations as it streamlines apps and retires legacy features. So we're, we're evolving beyond the original product offerings and focusing on improving the native app experience and doubling down on our flexible API-based ecosystem with improved device integration methods. So these these updates to the platform, to the backend, will improve security and stability, and it will empower developers to integrate with SmartThings using the language of their choice, laying the groundwork for the next generation of IoT innovation. So as part of this initiative, several features, products, and services will be replaced in a phased approach that will affect some users, but primarily developers and partners. And SmartThings will gently guide customers and developers through this transition with a comprehensive communications and support plan and make sure that they understand our vision for the future and uh, to also maintain their confidence in our, our brand and platform. And as you referred to earlier, these transitions will come in a series of phases, and we have sort of three high-level phases that are planned that are starting in the next uh, few weeks and months, and then we'll be continuing through 2021. Okay. For a second there, it sounded like you were reading off a script. Uh, <laughs> so bottom line on the API first platform, what we're looking at is y'all are going to have an API, That means I'm no longer going to develop on Groovy, which was the operating system that SmartThings has used for a while. And that'll give you all more control over how apps behave and that sort of thing. And it will also make things hopefully easier for developers because they can build in whatever they want. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so that is is a primary benefit for developers is that uh, they will be able to use the the language of their choice to be able to integrate with the SmartThings API and, um, for instance, developing smart apps on AWS Lambda, for example. And my Groovy apps, they're going to eventually go away. So if I have something in Groovy, it's going to go away and I should rebuild it using something else. Yes, and that's, and that's something that, uh, again, that's true, but it will be over a period of time and will come in phases. So the early phases of that, uh, those transitions will be apps that are very straightforward to, to basically accomplish the exact same thing in the native experience. And then over time, there's more complex smart apps and things that uh, won't be phased out until there's a suitable replacement. So we're really looking at doing this in a, in a phased way and making sure that when certain classes of smart apps are retired, that there is a suitable replacement for those smart apps that can be done either natively on the platform or on the app itself or easily through an API integration. I feel like there's a lot of apps on smart things. This is one of its benefits was like, I bought this weird thing in Germany or, you know, I I went someplace for it. I bought this crazy sensor and I wanted to integrate it into my heart smart home system for this really weird long tail use case. And 
I have done so. And I feel like there's probably a, a bunch of those, probably literally one-off cases. And I assume those kind of things may disappear those, those kind of things are, have been a staple uh, for smart things, and those things are not going away. Those types of integrations uh, we call device type handlers, where you can essentially support those types of one-off devices, things that are not standard, the uh, manufacturer maybe doesn't, hadn't supported them, and you can develop a device type handler that will allow that device to function on the platform. We have this today on the platform, and we are making certain changes to the way that those types of devices get integrated to improve their ability to run locally, like on the hub, those integrations on the hub, which can reduce latency and increase reliability of those types of devices. But we plan to continue maintaining that ability to support those types of one-off devices like that. On the platform, there's the Groovy Smart Apps, which is one thing, which is like developing simple rules or more advanced kind of mini applications that can provide some level of automation or intelligence. And then we also have Groovy-based DTHs, these device type handlers. And the way that those DTHs um, get integrated over time, like I said, may evolve, but we still we still plan to keep supporting that model. It is a unique differentiating thing about smart things. It is what we love. Okay. Oh, and the final thing is you guys are going to replace your IDE? Yes. And so finally, one of the phases that this will not begin until 2021 is a final wave of changes that will bring around the shutdown of legacy dev tools like our IDE and Graph. And these will be in favor of more simplified and more robust uh, developer tool sets. And so there will be more that comes in terms of announcements and information on that. Like I said, this is a further phase, which is yet in 2021. So this is something to note that will be coming and we're actively working on this now, but uh, there will be more, more communication and information on those as they become available. Okay. And I, I just, I feel like I should say it better be just as robust or more robust because I know people who play on smart things who get really into it, they are doing some crazy stuff and Lord love them. All right. So that is a lot happening here. How many of your users are still on smart things classic? So smart things classic, one thing just to note is that the smart things classic app uses the SmartThings platform to get you know, all of the data, the automations, et cetera. The modern SmartThings app also uses the platform uh, to get the same information. So they have the same source of truth in that sense. Our user base has steadily grown and we've seen the adoption rate continue to increase rapidly in the last few years. We today have 62 million monthly active users. And so those are users who have actively done something in the last 30 days. They've controlled the device. Uh, they've set up an automation that runs for them, for example. And that, that has grown significantly. And so we are, as we have been phasing people from using SmartThings Classic to the SmartThings mobile app, it's been a mix of those 62 million monthly active users, of which a majority now are using the, uh, the new app. So I, it sounds like I'm not going to get anything beyond a majority. Uh, right. Yeah. I, I don't have specific numbers uh, right now at this point, but it is a phased approach, which, um, as I mentioned, the SmartThings Classic app is intended to be retired around the end of Q3 or beginning of Q4, at which point there will be there will be zero. Got it. All right. Well, Mark, thank you so much for spending the time to go into this with us. It is a lot, and we will look forward to more communications from SmartThings. And I appreciate you coming on the show. Great. Thank you, Stacy. That's it for this week. Thanks so much for listening. And remember, if you'd like more IoT news, sign up for my newsletter at stacyoniot.com. We'll see you next week.